superb. It's really, really good. Uh, a nice insight into my creative psyche. <laughs>
So, so, resolution and independence. There was a roaring in the wind all night. The rain came heavily and fell in floods. But now the sun is rising calm and bright. The birds are singing in the distant woods. Over his own sweet voice the stock dove broods. And the jay makes answer as the magpie chatters. And all the air is filled with pleasant noise of waters. All things that love the sun are out of doors. The sky rejoices in the morning's birth. The grass is bright with raindrops on the moors. The hare is running races in her mirth. And with her feet she from the plashy earth raises a mist that, glittering in the sun, Runs with her all the way wherever she doth run. I was a traveller then upon the moor. I saw the hare that raced about with joy. I heard the woods in distant waters roar, or heard them not, as happy as a boy. The pleasant season did my heart employ. My old remembrances went from me wholly, and the way and all the ways of men so vain and melancholy. But as it sometimes chanceth from the might of joys in minds that can go no further, that can no further go, as high as we have mounted in delight, in our dejection do we sink as low. To me that morning it did happen so, and fears and fancies thick upon me came, dim sadness and blind thoughts I knew not, nor could name. I heard the skylark warbling in the sky, and I bethought me of the playful hair. Even such a happy child of earth am I, even as these blissful creatures I do, do I fare. Far from the world I walk, and from all care, but there, are, but there may come another day to me, solitude, pain of heart, distress, and poverty. My whole life I have lived in pleasant thought, as if life's business were a summer mood, as if all needful things would come unsought, to genial faith, still rich in genial mood, but how can he expect that others should build for him, sow for him, and call love, and at his call love him, for who himself will take no heed at all? I thought of Chatterton, the marvellous boy, the sleepless soul that perished in his pride, of him who walked in glory and in joy, following his plough along the mountainside. By our own spirits are we divide. We poets in our youth begin in gladness, but thereof come in the end of despondency and madness. Now, whether it were by peculiar grace, a leading from above, a something given, yet it befell that, in this lonely place, when I was with these untoward thoughts, as striven, beside a pool bare to, a pool bare to the eye of heaven, I saw a man before me unawares, the oldest man he seemed that ever wore grey hairs. A as a huge stone is sometimes seen to lie, couched on the bald top of an eminence, wonder to all who do the same espy, by what means it could thither come, and whence, so that it seems a thing endured with sense, like a bee, sea beast crawled forth, that on a shelf of rock or sand reposeth, there to sun itself. Such seemed this man, not all alive nor dead, nor all asleep in his extreme old age. His body was bent double, feet and head coming together in life's pilgrimage, as if some dire constraint of pain or rage, of sickness felt by him in times long past, a more human weight upon his fame, frame had cast. Himself he propped, limbs, body, and pale face, face upon a long grey staff of shaven wood. And still as I drew near with gentle pace, 
face upon the margin of that moorish flood, motionless as a cloud, the old man stood. That heareth not the clouds, winds when they call, and moveth altogether if it move at all. At length himself unsettling, he the bond stirred with his staff, and fixedly did look upon the muddy water, which he conned as if it had been reading in a book. A stranger's privilege I took, and drawing to his side, to him did say, This morning gives us promise of a glorious day. A gentle answer did the old man make, in courteous speech with forth he slowly drew, and him with further words I thus bespake. What occupation do you there pursue? In this, this is a lonesome place for one like you. Here he replied, a flash of mild surprise broke from the stable oars of his yet vivid eyes. His words came feebly, from a feeble chest, but each in solemn order followed each, with something of a lofty utterance dressed, choice word and measured phrase above the reach of ordinary men, a stately speech. Such as grave livers do in Scotland use. Religious men who give God and man their dues. He told that to these waters he had come to gather leeches, being old and poor, employment hazardous and wearisome, and he had many hardships to endure. From bond to bond he roamed, from moor to moor, housing with God's good help by choice or chance, and in this way, and in this way he gained an honest maintenance. The old man did, <laughs> the old man still stood talking by my side, but now his voice to me was like a stream, scarce heard, nor word from word could I divine, and the whole body of the man did seem like the one whom I had met with in a dream or like a man from some far region sent to give me human strength by apt admonishment. My former thoughts returned, the fear that kills, and hope that is unwilling to be fed, cold, pain, and labour, all fleshy ills, and mighty poets in their misery dead, perplexed and longing to be comforted, my question eagerly did I renew. How is it that you live? And what is it you do? He with a smile did then his words repeat, And said that gathering leeches far and wide he travelled, Stirring thus about his feet, The waters of the pools where they abide. Once I could meet with them on every side, But they have dwindled long in slow decay, Yet I still persevere and find them where I may. While he was talking thus, the lonely place, the old man's shape, and speech all troubled me, and in my mind's eye I seemed to see him pace about the weary moors continually, wandering about alone and silently, while I these thoughts within myself pursued, he, having made a pause, the same discourse renewed, and soon with this the other matter blended, cheerfully uttered, with demeanour kind, but stately in the main, and when he ended, I could have laughed myself to scorn to find that decrepit man so firm a mind. God, said I, be my help and stay secure. I'll think of the leech gatherer on the lonely moor. That's it. What did you think of that? That took a twist I wasn't expecting. I thought it might take a twist about bunnies and rain, but I wasn't expecting it to get so um, into conversation about uh, self-loathing and uh, anxious thoughts of the poet, and how that could be stilled by seeing an old man doing hard work. Um, yeah, I think that's what it meant, that's what it meant to me, is that what it meant to you? Is that what you got out of
surprised by Joy. Surprised by Joy, impatient as the wind, I turn to share the transport, oh, with whom but thee, long buried in the silent tomb, that spot which no, ah, oh, there's a word I don't know. This is vicissitude, 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 do you know what that means? Tell me in the comments below. Surprised by joy, impatient as the wind, I turn to share the transport, oh, with whom but thee, long buried in the silent tomb, that spot which no vicissitude can find, love, faithful love, recalled thee to my mind. But how could I forget thee, through what power, even for the least division of an hour? Have I been so beguiled as to be blind to my most grievous loss? That thought's return was the worst pang that sorrow ever bore. Save one, one only, when I stood forlorn, knowing my heart's best treasure was no more, that neither present time nor years unborn could do my sight that heavenly face restore. Wow, wow, wow. So that tiny poem that has joy in the title was not at all about joy. It wasn't about joy. It was a sad poem. A sad poem about losing someone that you love. So that's annoying. Thank you, Wordsworth. <laughs> such from the head that is 
is hoary. <laughs> what care I for the wreaths that can only give glory? O oh, fame, if ever I took delight in thy praises, twas less for the sake of thy high-sounding phrases than to see the bright eyes of the dear one discover she thought that I was not unworthy to love her. There chiefly I sought thee, there only I found thee. Her glance was the best of the rays that surround thee. When it sparkled, O oh court, that was bright in my story. I knew it was love, and I felt it was glory. That wasn't bad, I liked that. What did I think that one was about? I think that one was about... I think that one was about how um, young people like shiny and pretty things. And then as we grow older, we like uh, fame and to be loved because then we would feel we were worthy of loving people uh, individually and feel that other people, we, we are worthy of being loved um, instead of instead of having nice things. It's about being loved by nice people. And I knew it was love and I felt it was glory. So the only real glory is that of being loved by someone. I really like that. So you do everything for love. It's all for love. Alright. Now that's a romantic poem. That's it. I found it. The romantic poem in this book of the romantic poets. The romantic poets. That was nice. I really enjoyed that. Let me know if you want to hear more poetry or if you want to hear a different type of story next time. I think I will read more poems. I believe in here the is the rhyme of the ancient mariner is in here, which is my mother's favorite poem. It's very long. It's very, very long. And it's quite complicated, but I believe I understand the visionary now. Um, and I would like to read that to you. Um, so I will do that in another video at some stage. Not to 